One summer day, many years ago, my stepmother was getting together with a good friend of hers who was in town. And I was only a young kid, uh, and since I was with her, and her friend also had a son, they decided to take us to the local amusement park. And it seemed like a perfect plan. You know, the boys would get to play and ride rides while they would get to talk and catch up and spend time together. But there was just one problem with their plan. I was right at the age where I would not stop talking. I just wouldn't stop talking. I was a young kid and I was filled with ideas and curiosity and being surrounded by all kinds of exciting stuff at an amusement park only heightened all of that. And so when we were waiting in lines, I was talking. Uh, when we were walking through the park, I was talking. When we sat down for lunch, I was talking. Uh, the, the only break that they got was the minute or two uh, while I was out on one of the rides. And then I would come back and I was talking, right? Uh, by the end of the day, they hardly had gotten in a word edgewise. I was this little human chatterbox and had effectively spoiled their whole plan for a fun day catching up with each other. Now, fast forward several years. Uh, I, I'm probably about 18 years old, just about to head off to college. My dad and I were sitting out on the front porch one morning, sipping coffee and talking. We did this often, and we still do to this day whenever we're together in the morning. We would sit around sipping coffee and talk about life and faith. And back in high school, I would talk to him about relationships with girls and all kinds of stuff that was going on at school. I would share things that I was learning things that I was thinking about. But I'll never forget this particular morning. My dad sat forward in his chair and he said to me, well, son, now that you're getting older, our conversations are, are going to start going both ways. And sometimes I'll share with you some of the things that I'm going through. And he proceeded to share with me some of the challenges that he had been facing at work. And, and the way that he was feeling about them and, and what, what he was working on. And in that moment, shifted our conversation. It, it went from me mostly talking to him to us talking with each other. And this shifted our relationship. I mean, obviously, he was still my dad. But our relationship became more mutual in that moment. And it grew a little bit deeper. I'm grateful for that moment and my relationship with my dad and for our continued morning coffee conversations. Now, as we continue our series on prayer, uh, I share these stories to illustrate something. When we pray, it is often a lot like me as a kid in that amusement park. Right? Our prayers can be a long and nonstop chattering of wishes and, and requests that we say to God. And that's not a bad thing. You know, it is good to bring our concerns to God in prayer. But there is an invitation in prayer, just like the invitation that my dad gave me in that morning conversation. There's this invitation for prayer to shift from us monologuing at God to dialoguing with God. There's this invitation in our prayers to shift from talking to God to talking with God. And if you remember all the way back to the beginning of the series a couple weeks ago, if our prayers are rooted in relationship, that means that this shift does not only happen in our relationship with God, but also in our relationship with each other. If our prayers are invited to shift from talking to God to talking with God, then we are also invited to shift from praying for each other to also praying with each other. And when we shift from only praying for each other to being with each other in prayer, our prayers begin to take shape just like the gospel. They begin to become gospel-shaped prayers where the gospel in Jesus, God becomes flesh to dwell with us. And this is what our prayers are like as we pray with 
each other. And so open up your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 is what we're going to be reading today. Today we're going to look at a passage here that gives us some instructions about praying for each other. But we will see that this instruction is rooted in the gospel story of being with each other. As we read this passage, I hope we'll be able to hear the invitation to move from talking to God to talking with God, to move from praying for each other to praying with each other. So let's read 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God. There is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. O oh Lord, thank you for drawing us near to you in prayer. And thank you for the gift of your word. I ask as we reflect on your scripture that you would sharpen our minds and soften our hearts, that we might know you and love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this passage that we've just read begins with some instructions on praying for each other, right? But then it moves to the gospel posture of praying with. And I want to trace this theme together through the passage. And so let's start right back at the beginning, all right? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, the specific instructions on prayer start with the phrase, first of all. This is a reference not to sequence, but to importance, right? Paul is not saying that the church has to start each gathering with prayer, although we usually do begin by praying the Lord's Prayer together. But, but rather, he's saying that praying is not what needs to happen first, but rather it is the thing that is of first importance among the church. Prayer is is the defining characteristic of God's people. We are essentially called to be a people of prayer. This is what sets us apart from everything else. Look, what's the difference between church gatherings and any common social club? Well, when the church gathers, it is an act of prayer. Without prayer, we're just a social club some kind of group, some kind of hobby, right? But what's the difference between our bag program and the local food bank? Well, our bag program is an act of prayer. This is something that we do in prayer to God. Uh, what's the difference between our serving at Reach Out and, and then any other regular soup kitchen around the world? Well, our service in Reach Out shelters is an act of prayer right? What's the difference between our Bible studies and any other student going to school? Well, our Bible studies are an act of prayer. Prayer is the essential identity of God's people. This is what sets us apart from all other people. Prayer is not an optional add-on for Christians, for followers of Christ, it is our life blood. Prayer is what makes us who we are. That's why Paul begins these instructions by saying, first of all. 
And then he moves on to use four different words for prayer. If you keep reading, he says supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. Now, I wish that I could tell you that with these four words, Paul is constructing some sort of systematic understanding of prayer, which each one has a super specific meaning that we should apply in a super specific way. That would make prayer so easy, right? But I can't tell you that. Because as I've read different commentaries on this verse this week, it, it became clear that Paul is not constructing a systematic way of praying. Rather, it's, it's a lot more like he looked up the word prayer in a thesaurus and he just listed off several of the entries that he found there. But each one of these does have a little bit of its own connotation, so I'll share with you a little bit. Supplications refers to expressing an urgent need. Uh, some translations say petitions. Prayers is a general word for just communicating with God. It's kind of a catch-all word, prayer. Intercessions refers to asking a higher authority, often on behalf of someone else, to intercede, to, to stand in the place of and, and ask for. Uh, thanksgivings uh, should be a little bit more obvious. It refers to expressing gratitude, to saying thank you, right? But these four words are not meant to be an exhaustive list of prayer. Rather, they're more of a suggestive list that's meant to suggest and inspire us into all different kinds of ways of praying. Basically, by using all of these different words, Paul is saying that there are all different ways of praying. And however you do it, it is of first importance. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made. So Paul says that there are all kinds of prayers, but he goes on to say that they should be made for all kinds of people, right? These are to be made for everyone. And this is really important for us to consider because I think we can often become pretty self-focused in our prayers. One of the commentaries that I was reading put it this way. It says the reminder that prayer is for everyone is timely in view of the temptation to confine our prayers to our own narrow interests. The wider the subjects for prayer, the larger becomes the vision of the soul that prays. I love that. Prayer is meant to enlarge our vision. It's supposed to help us see more than just ourselves. It's meant to grow our hearts. And this happens as we pray for others. We enlarge our hearts and move beyond ourselves as we pray for our friends and family members, as we share concerns and prayer requests in the church, you know, when those pop up in your inbox throughout the week. But our prayers are meant to stretch even further than that. Look at verse 2. Paul tells them to pray for everyone. In verse 2, he says, even for kings and all who are in high positions. Now, I, I think this means at least two things. First, Paul says to pray for the rulers and not to the rulers. And, and this is huge, especially in their context. It was common in that day to sort of deify the ruler and make them into some sort of God who you pray to, who you follow who you sometimes would even offer sacrifices to back in the ancient world. And Paul is having none of that. God is the one that we pray to. God is the one that we follow, not the king. In fact, the king, this ruler, is actually someone who needs prayer. Not someone to pray to. There's someone who actually needs to be prayed for. This means that God's people can never place their hope in the, the high positions, right? In kings and, and high positions of authority. All we can do is pray for the kings and pray for those in positions of authority. And I think this does have huge implications for us today because we live in a highly politicized society where everyone is being asked to declare their allegiance to one political party or another. And we must 
follow Paul's instructions here and be a people who refuse to worship the rulers of our age, but instead recognize that they fall far short of God. We pledge our allegiance to him only. We are not to pray to one party or another, but rather to pray for all the leaders of our land. And so the ruler then was often viewed as, as a godlike figure. And Paul says no to that. But the rulers were also actively opposed to the church. I mean, who were the ones that threw Paul in prison? Who were the ones that were persecuting the early church? Who were the ones, for that matter, that nailed Jesus to the cross? Wasn't it the rulers and those in high positions? Yes. And Paul says to pray for them. When Paul says to pray for kings and all who are in high positions, he is telling the early church to pray for their enemies, to pray for the very ones who are putting them in prison and hunting them down and persecuting them. When Paul says that prayers should be made for everyone, he really means it. Not only friends and family, not only others in the church, everyone. Jesus put it like this in Matthew chapter 5, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You see, prayer is meant to expand our hearts, to even embrace the ones who we consider to be our enemies. And so I wonder, who are the ones that make your blood boil? The ones who you just want to lash out at. You see, social media and news programs have trained us to respond in a certain way by arguing and, and by shouting at one another. But prayer trains us to respond differently. We must cultivate love for our enemies, as we pray even for those who persecute us. This is the hard work of peacemaking, right? The reason that we love and pray for our enemies, Paul says here, is to live lives of peace and godliness. But peacemaking doesn't just mean that we keep to ourselves. It is the hard work of befriending our enemies and also repenting of the ways that we have been enemies ourselves. And all of this, all of this has its foundation in being a people of prayer who prays for others. But as praying for others begins to expand our hearts, we get to be led even deeper into this gospel-shaped posture of not only praying for but also praying with. And that is exactly where Paul goes in the rest of the passage. In verses 3 and 4, Paul connects these instructions that he's given about prayer to the good news of salvation. He writes, God is our Savior who desires everyone to be saved. And then in verses 5 and 6, he, he goes even deeper. He explains this even more. He says, for there is one God, and there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself, human, who gave himself a ransom for all. You see, our call to be a people of prayer is only possible because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, there's actually a phrase that we use pretty often that connects these things. What do we often say at the end of our prayers? In Jesus' name, amen. Right? 
Every time we end our prayer with this, we are acknowledging that our prayers are connected with the good news of Jesus. Now, this is a common phrase that we tag onto the end of our prayers, but it's not some kind of magical formula, right? What does it actually mean in the name of Jesus? Well, Richard Foster describes two meanings for for this. First, he says, to pray in the name of Jesus means to pray in full assurance of the great work Christ accomplished in his life, by his death, through his resurrection, and by means of his continuing reign at the right hand of God the Father. In other words, prayer is only possible because of what Jesus has done. As Paul puts it in our passage, Jesus is the mediator between God and humankind. It's as if our prayers are letters, and Jesus is the courier delivering them. Right? They only reach their destination by means of his life, death, resurrection, and rule. But there's a second meaning to prayer in Jesus' name. And Richard Foster describes it this way. He writes, To pray in the name of Jesus means that we are praying in accord with the way and nature of Christ. It means that we are making the kinds of intercessions that he would make if he were among us today in the flesh. So to pray in Jesus' name means that we don't only pray through Jesus as our mediator, but we also pray like Jesus as our great teacher and Lord. And well, how does Jesus pray? How how can we pray like Jesus? Well, Jesus didn't stay up in heaven just praying for people, right? The gospel says that he put on flesh to be with people in prayer. We see this highlighted in verse 5 of our passage. There is one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself, human. In Jesus, God became human to be with us. And so as we pray in Jesus' name, we're not only praying through Jesus, but also praying like Jesus, which means that we're not only to pray for people, but actually pray with people. We see Jesus do this time and again. Like when the woman was caught in adultery and he didn't only speak for her, he actually got down on the ground with her. Or when Jesus comes to Mary after Lazarus died, he doesn't just pray for her, he weeps with her. This is how we are to pray, not only for, but with. And we see instructions like this in other places throughout Scripture. In Romans 12, Paul tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. Or in Hebrews 13, the author tells us to remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Remember those who are being tortured as though you yourselves were being tortured. You see, as we pray, we are not only to pray for, but to pray with. And praying like this, will absolutely transform our prayers, right? It begins to expand our vision and grow our hearts. You know, instead of beginning our prayers with, I ask this and I ask that, we start beginning our prayers with we, right? Instead of praying for whatever we think is best, we begin to put ourselves in the shoes of those we pray for. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. This will shift us from, you know, instead of judging criminals and prisoners, we might put ourselves in their shoes and pray, Lord, we pray with those in prison who feel stuck and long for the freedom of new beginnings. Or remember those who are being tortured as though you yourselves were being tortured. 
Instead of offering platitudes to people who are in pain, we might put ourselves in their shoes and pray something like, Lord, we pray with those who are suffering. Life feels hopeless, and so we ask for your help. As we shift from praying for to praying with, our whole prayer life can be transformed. Prayer becomes a way that that we actually become more loving and more compassionate people. Praying with becomes a practical way for our prayers to remain rooted in relationship, which is what we've been talking about throughout this whole series. So here's my challenge to you this week. I want you to try to expand your vision by praying for others, right? Friends, family, and enemies as well. But as you begin praying for them, try to put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself in their place and shift from praying praying for them to praying with them. The question that I would love to have at the front of your mind this week is this. How can I pray with you? Not just how can I pray for you. How can I pray with you? Ask this question in conversations. Ask it as you scroll through your social media. Ask it as you watch the news. Ask this question when you receive church emails with prayer requests. How can I pray with you? Let us not only be a people who pray for each other, but actually pray with each other. And I'll remind you again of the common prayer resource that I want all of you to continue in for the rest of this month. You can scroll down into the resource section on this page and download the app or view it on the website or order the book. In this resource of common prayer every day, There's a line in the morning prayer that says, prayers for others. That is an invitation to put this passage into practice as we pray for and pray with. And so let our prayers become a tool for growing in love, a way of growing in compassion, a way of growing deeper roots and our relationship with God as our Father and one another as our family. May it be so. Amen.